Hello and welcome back to 52%, the show that talks about everything and anything going on in Liverpool and beyond from the perspective of 52% of the population, women. Today we are focusing on a very special cause that's working to fight the former cancer responsible for the deaths of more people than any other in the UK. It's the Roy Castle Foundation and here's what's coming up. Now, before we meet our guests on today's panel, we thought we'd ask you the question that the Roy Castle team put to the public out on the streets of Liverpool. Which form of cancer is the biggest killer of women in the UK? Just take a look at this. It's breast cancer. I would say breast cancer. Breast cancer. Cervical cancer. Wound cancer. Breast cancer. Breast cancer. Breast cancer. Ovarian cancer. Breast cancer. Breast. I think it could be breast cancer. Breast cancer, maybe? Breast. Breast. I'd say breast cancer. Breast cancer. I would imagine it's breast cancer, but I don't know for certain. Breast cancer? Probably breast cancer. Ovarian. Cervical uh, cancer? Breast cancer. Ovarian cancer. Uh, I'd say ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer. Yeah, I'd go for breast cancer, I think. Um, biggest one, heart lung cancer. With us today is Paula Chadwick, the Chief Exec of the Roy Castle Lung Cancer Foundation. She'd been raising awareness with the charity for over 20 years. We're also joined by Michelle with us here, who is actually a patient, so she's going to be talking a lot about her experience with the Roy Castle Foundation to help people that have been affected by this terrible disease. Now, I, I'm going to touch on this later. I've had quite a lot of involvement with the charity because I lost my father, my dad, Mike Flynn, um, with lung cancer, which is what raised my awareness of the incredible work you do. Paula, just tell us how you got involved with the charity. Okay, well, I personally got involved um, way back in, uh, the charity was formed in 1990, as you are aware, by the amazing Mr. Donnelly, who was a chest physician at Broad Green Hospital. And um, he actually was really dismayed and really upset and wanted to do something about the number of lung cancer patients he was seeing at his clinic. Um, and basically he just didn't have time to spend with them. You know, the clinics were 10 minute slots and he was telling them these devastating news because there was no real curative treatment. There was really nothing mm -hmm. on the horizon. Um, and he was telling them these really horrible news and then they were just left to digest that yeah. and there was I mean, no follow-up. We'll go back to that again in a minute. I, rem I remember somebody actually termed it at one point the six-month cancer yeah. Yeah. because mm. if you lived, and, and my dad was the same, he got diagnosed yeah. in the May, died in the November. Oh. It's it's such a short time because mm. it's, it's the symptoms, there's no symptoms. Well, the, the symptoms, unfortunately, can be masked by other things, you know, a cough, People think they've just got bronchitis, a chest infection. So by the time they actually are normally diagnosed, it's really too late at stage four or whatever, and there is no curative treatment, which is, you know, one of the things that Professor Donnelly really set out to do is to look at early diagnosis because, you know, if it's diagnosed early enough, you can have surgery. There are, you know, there are people, as Michelle will tell you, who are living you know, with lung cancer beyond a diagnosis. So that was his mission and his, his vision was to build the first international lung cancer centre that dedicated solely to um, the research early detection into lung cancer in Liverpool. And um, so he set off on a mission in his office to do that. Um, and as you know, Roy Castle um, was diagnosed with lung cancer and um, he came on board in 1990 with us um, 
that basically, you know, he dedicated his last 12 months, his last six months, he basically died on that tour. You know, he was dying on that tour, but he wanted to do something to raise awareness. He said, you know, whatever I can do, I will do. Um, I won't see any benefits, but he wanted to see benefits for his children in the future mm -hmm. that this dreadful disease you know, we would do something about it. Well, I think that's it. And I, one thing that you often find with lung cancer, it's a very unsympathetic charity. And the first thing people go is, well, did they smoke? And it's like, right, well, you're written off, it's your own fault. And, exactly. and Roy Castle is a, a perfect example of the fact that that's simply not the case, isn't it? No, I mean, Roy Castle was the first one to highlight passive smoking, um, you know, because he did have um, non-small cell lung cancer, which is normally associated with smoking. I mean, there's no getting away from the fact that smoking is a cause of lung cancer. But we also have, and um, particularly lately, what we're seeing is, as we're talking about today, is the rise in women um, who are getting lung cancer, is that 20% of people who are diagnosed with lung cancer have never smoked. But for us at the Roy Castle, it's, you know, it is about reducing that stigma. You know, if you've got lungs, you can get lung cancer. Smoker, ex-smoker, non-smoker, it really shouldn't matter at all. People should not be afraid of going to their doctors or seeking help or talking about it. You know, we need to get rid of that stigma so that people do talk openly about what this is and we can get people seen quickly. You know, that this, I know this sounds really strange to say, but this is really an exciting time for lung cancer. We've got the possibility of screening coming available. Mm -hmm. We've got new drugs coming through. There's immunotherapy, you know, we've never had these, you know, I've been with the charity, as I said, 10, 20 years, and it's the last five years we're seeing these really breakthroughs that if people can be diagnosed early enough, there is real hope and help yeah. there for them. And it's, it's yeah. funny because it's, it's 10 years since my dad, so I've obviously yeah. been involved with yourself yeah. since then. And I remember going out there to, you know, actually I very kindly got invited to go and see the lab in, in Liverpool. And I, I remember talking to one of the guys down there and he was doing everything and he said, it, I know it sounds stupid, but you can't believe it's in your city. This little, it is yeah. unbelievable, the work that goes on. I, I was walking around in awe of it and you're thinking, this is actually coming from here. Yeah. This is coming from here. And, and, they, and one, one of the guys who was working there, he just turned around and I said, the, the work you're doing is incredible. He said, all I want to do is have people to come up to me. And instead of saying, my dad died of lung cancer, they'll say, oh, my dad had lung cancer 10 years ago. And he said, and I'll never forget that conversation because that's how dedicated they all they are down there, isn't we're, it? We're very passionate about what we do. Well, as you know, Claire, yeah. you've been involved with us for a while. <laughs> and, um, you know, we are. And, you know, our vision is, as you've just said, a world where no one dies of lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And that can be, you know, I believe it can be achievable. You know, we will do it because, you know, I am dedicated to making yes, sure that we definitely well, do it. it. Things like, you know, you can try to get the mo. I want to know one of the things that you were trying to get behind is to get the mobile, you know, it's have had the breast screen and the mammograms like that for certain people. You were trying to get the mobiles out on the streets, weren't you, where, yeah. where you can do a test that, that can pick something up, yeah. can't you? And that's hopefully what we're doing. And, you know, we do fund um, research right across the UK now into early diagnosis, which, you know, what we're looking for is tests that, you know, breath tests or a simple scraping from your cheek that can identify cells mutate, that are mutating, you know, watch you and make sure that you don't. So in, less invasive treatment treatment and yet yeah, the mobile screening is something CT screening is something that we're getting really excited about and going to be pushing for and campaigning for so watch well, this space I, sorry to interrupt there but I'm, I'm very interested in like a swab test as a diagnosis yes, is this yes, a possibility yes. it's a possibility we're funding research at um, UCL at the moment in London because looking that's, some that's early like research. a really cost-effective way exactly hasn't it and exactly. easy and accessible yeah, that people could send you know kits out wow, for people who do it in it? that yeah. yeah that's what i'm saying there's really so much innovative real research going on yeah. into the early diagnosis um side that it's 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 really exciting and going to be you know make real changes yeah. well, that is like you one way as you say isn't yeah. it and it's i think the thing is as well that i mean i don't know if you'd have an answer for this but why do you think the statistics for women is it's such a big killer in women in particular well i think I think looking at our research of what we've thought as it, it's dating back to like the war when the whole women's roles and changed during that didn't you know women started going out to work because the men were there they got openly were you know smoking and cigarettes some of them got paid in the um, in the cigarette factories in cigarettes so instead of wages so it became more liberal that women 
had a much bigger voice and they did come into their own sort of thing, if you want to say, and they, you know, they did smoke more. So you've got that and then you've got obviously during the, the 60s, the, you know, the high advertising of it was cool to smoke and you had all the movie stars had cigarettes. Oh, and, and the women's cigarettes, yes, the Vogue cigarettes. Yes, and so and as cigarettes. Well. You had yes, all that. weight loss. Yes. yes. Well, that's but the problem with young kids, the children now, particularly young girls now. You know, that's the pressure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also something for your hands. I can almost say that people of a generation where they didn't realise the dangers of smoking, I I understand that. But mm -hmm. now, I don't understand, regardless of anything, why you'd pick up a cigarette. No, you, you know, no. Yeah. And yeah, you can talk about weight loss, you can talk about everything, but I know that you've got the fag end side of which we will yeah, speak about yeah. later as well, um, where you're sort of going out amongst the youngsters, aren't you? And you're telling children in schools about the dangers of it now and take the coolness away. Yeah, well, we've, we've just merged with, um, funnily enough, like 12 months ago, we just merged with the Deborah Hutton Cup Films campaign, which is big in London. Mm -hmm. And um, Deborah Hutton was um, died of lung cancer at she was in her 40s, left um, three children behind, um, a journalist for um, Vogue magazine. Um, and again, diagnosed quite late, very quick. Um, well, we'll, pick, we'll pick up an next yeah. story in just a few minutes from now, OK? But do join us after the break where we'll hear more about that and how to spot the signs of lung cancer, as we said, and how it has helped fight so many people against this disease at the Roy Castle Lung Cancer Foundation. Welcome back. And today we're finding out about one of the biggest killers in the UK, lung cancer. We're joined by the wonderful Paula Chadwick and Michelle from the Roy Castle Lung Cancer Foundation. But before we find out more from Paula and Michelle, here's a short video on some of the statistics of lung cancer in women. Every single day, 44 women die from lung cancer, a staggering statistic that has risen over the last 10 years. Lung cancer is the biggest cancer killer of women in the United Kingdom. Your chances of developing lung cancer can be reduced by avoiding certain risk factors, such as smoking, passive smoking, or exposure to other harmful chemicals. However, anyone with lungs can be affected. We only partly understand some of the other causes of this dreadful disease that devastates the lives of so many families. Here at Roy Castle Lung Cancer Foundation, we are doing everything we can in order to beat lung cancer sooner and save more lives. We can achieve this through education, prevention and further research funding. As it currently stands, lung cancer patients are being diagnosed too late, with only 23% being diagnosed at an early stage. We need to work towards prevention of late, and misdiagnosis, as well as introducing screening procedures and improved methods of treatment. The signs and symptoms for lung cancer include a persistent cough, chest pain, breathlessness, fatigue, and loss of appetite. If you have any of these symptoms, the first thing you should do is visit your GP. At Roy Castle Lung Cancer Foundation, we are doing everything possible to promote positive change for the future. But we need more support to drive this vital change. More awareness means more early diagnosis and ultimately more lives saved. Lung cancer is the biggest cancer killer of women and continues to be on the rise. We must put an end to this now. Please visit roycastle.org for more information on the signs and symptoms of lung cancer and share this video to help create awareness. Now we were speaking just before the break to Paula about a lady, Deborah Hutton, isn't it? Just tell us quickly again, I know that we, we touched on it a little earlier. So um, she wanted to do something, she had three young children and her husband Charlie Stebbings um, is a filmmaker. So he does a lot of film. So he wanted to do something about smoking and film that, that was his skills, his film. So what we've done is we've merged with them and they are going to be our, well, they are our prevention and education side of what we're doing. So trying to stop young people from smoking, you know, don't even take up the habit. So we go in with a film crew and uh, we work, work with the uh, children on a youth basis and uh, 
from any age and work with them on, they make their own film. So we give them information and they storyboard, they edit it, they make their own film, they act in the film, they do a little short video. It goes forward to be um, into a competition. They promote the competition, get their, all their friends to share it and look at it. And we have like a little uh, award ceremony at the BAFTAs <laughs> in London. And the, the best one gets like, um, you know, and thing. It's actually at the BAFTAs. Yeah, yeah, oh, right. yeah, 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 it's amazing. I was like, that's selfies at the BAFTAs. I was so excited. <laughs> Um, but it's a really great way from peer to peer. Mm. So it's mm. it's getting the, the children and the youth to talk to each other well, about the... They're invested the in it, aren't they? Yes, if they're, if they're exactly. Involved, rather than just being told and lectured, exactly. they're creating the story yeah. themselves. Yeah. So and understanding yeah. it and just taking away that myth and, and that, you know, that the, they're not pressured into smoking and it's uncool mm. to smoke. Mm. Yeah, and they are the cool kids. Thing, yeah. mm -hmm. Now we've spoken a lot about early diagnosis and we've spoken a lot about how treatment can help people. Michelle, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, you've been diagnosed with lung cancer, haven't you? And uh, yeah. would you just tell, to tell us a little bit so about your story? I was diagnosed story? in um, 1980, 1989, um, eight and a half years ago, with advanced lung cancer. I was given a prognosis of two and a half years. So I see my role um, working along, not working alongside, but uh, as a patient advocate to give hope to people who are diagnosed with lung cancer, especially ladies. Um, and I was inoperable, but I had, uh, took part in a soccer trial, which was combined chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Nearly killed me, but I'm still here. I've got a fantastic um, oncologist who looks after me at heart and chest over from Clatterbridge, and it's just, I want to do well to give thanks to the staff. I, unfortunately, my mum and dad have both just passed away from lung cancer. Um, um, about a year ago, my mum and my dad was nine months before a strong family history. So it's getting the message across, but it's not all doom and gloom, lung cancer. There's new, there's new treatments coming. Just go to your doctor if you have any signs, any symptoms. If your doctor doesn't listen, go back, see him again. Don't take no for an answer. I was not really listened to by my surgeon. So Did you feel unwell at the time? Or yeah, had you gone I'd back? been on holiday. I was under the doctors anyway at the hospital because I'd coughed up blood and this had been a long standing problem, but I was still working as a nurse thirteen hour shifts. And I had some medical knowledge and I just felt that the doctors weren't listening to me. So I went after my holiday, I'd brought my appointment forward and I said I'm not moving out the room until you do something, and it's the best thing I ever did. <laughs> and so he went and he got the consultant, and the consultant come in, and he was like, well, I'll have another lockdown. I was, I was like, I'm, I'm not right, I'm telling you. And he was like, but your scan's all right, it hasn't changed. I was like, no. So how come nothing had shown up on a scan then? Is I, 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 it's a bit complicated because I'm a bit of an unusual one. <laughs> <laughs> got, oh, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're fine on this panel. <laughs> yeah, so I've got like vascular masses in um, my lungs and my bowel and my spleen. Blah, blah. So they were getting monitored and really I had enlarged lymph nodes in my mediastine and, and I'd gone to see like a geneticist and, and he was saying, they're not right. And he gave me the confidence really to go and stand up to the doctors and say, look, he's telling me they're not right. I feel different being on holiday. I'd lost weight, which is great when you're on holiday, isn't it? But, but unusual. I know, yeah, time. I know. Yeah. So, um, but I just knew in myself, you know, yeah, when you, you know that feeling yeah, exactly. that you're not yeah. right. And I just thought, if I don't do this for me, I'd be in work, like, being an advocate for the patient, saying, you know, speak to your doctors, tell them. And then if I couldn't do that for myself, then no one else was going to do it for me. So they did listen, thank God. So it was God. 89, was it, that you yeah. done? So, oh, I was the only 39, to to so yeah, yeah okay, 30 how many years? But again, are you still having treatment or no, is it? I just have regular scans. So I've got one in about two weeks, so I have scans. So it's, it's touch wood, it's completely... It's stable. Oh you just my say it's goodness stable, me, yeah, that's so, like... Yeah, I am stubborn. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, that is no, just like it's incredible, not isn't it? I know, I know. It really, so I know really I am is. a lucky one and I just think it's important. But mm. just to say, you know, be positive and you mm. know not every day is good and not every day I get up and put makeup on a lot of the days I stay on the couch but they yeah, you know, I know well, but then you have your good days and you have your bad days it? and you just make the most of your good days and so yeah. how did you become involved with with the lung cancer foundation um, 
how did I become involved? <laughs> well, I, because I was a nurse and I'd got medically retired because my job was too hard, I was a wardress at the Royal, um, it just became too much. I tried for two years and it, was just, it just wasn't working. So I needed something to do that wasn't too strenuous that I could do in my own time. So I started um, looking at the um, patient information leaflets and giving some advice from a patient point of view and also as a nurse because I'd nursed patients with cancer so I had some insight so that's how I started really and then it just became a bit more and then I did some the magazine and then I've done TV for them and oh. then I did a ball and oh, oh the yeah. terrors yeah. they broke you into all kinds yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you know funny my story is very yeah. similar I do one thing but I do enjoy it and it's great you know oh. and I know they appreciate me and I appreciate them for all the work they do and I see the great work that's going on in London as in um, as part of the CRG, which yeah. Roy Castle um, sponsored and actually advising the government on like new treatment plans and the way early diagnosis should be. So it's all, mm -hmm. it's great to see doctors who are so passionate. You I know, mean, that um, really is the key thing. I know yeah. with, with the symptoms, I keep going back to it, but you can only speak of your own symptoms. But again, all, all my dad had was, was a slight cough. Yeah, it was really a slight mean. cough. Um, and then I remember in the May, we were, we'd gone away for a few days and this lump appeared and I was like, oh, what have you been doing? I think we'd been in like some sort of fun village. And he was still, apart from being a little bit tired, he just had the, and this lump appeared. So we said, right, when we get back, we're going to take you, um, took him the doc, made him go to the doctor. Oh, I'm nothing wrong with me. I'm all right. Oh, I'm just a cough. And then a week later when we got the phone call, uh, by that point, um, he'd had like a 21 centimetre tumour, which was attached to his rib cage, totally inoperable, couldn't do, couldn't do anything. But that's how big a tumour he had by that point. And that's why I was saying about... And the only the, symptom was a the minor The only cough. symptoms he'd felt a little bit tired, but he did work a lot, mm. workaholic, <laughs> bit of a theme in our family. <laughs> um, but he, um, he worked a lot. He had a bit of a cough There was absolutely Nothing else, nothing else oh, that's terrifying. at all. I just want to go back, you know you said that people get given like 10 minute slots or whatever and you're given like devastating news like that. It must just be absolutely traumatising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that is one of the, the issues. Um, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's as stark as that now because we do have um, lung cancer specialist nurses now. So, and um, most or all, this is what we want to make sure there's no variation that all um, health centres have full multidisciplinary teams. So, you know, you do have a full pathway from diagnosis right through to treatment options and what's available to you. Um, but back in the 1990s, that was the reality. And the, the problem was, as, as Claire quite rightly said, is you were just written off, oh, you smoke, it's your, yeah. it's your own fault. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the biggest issue now we have with women, particularly, is that, like in Michelle, um, late diagnosis or misdiagnosis, um, because they don't really look for the symptoms, because we've got a lot of women coming through under 40 or in early 40s, and that is just not on their radar. They're looking, you know, the stereotyped over 70s, yeah. you know, male who mm -hmm. smoked 100 wood bands a week. So young women coming through, it's not, what you it's not to that, yes. No. yes. Well, we are good. we're just going to take a break for a moment, but when we come back, we will be meeting an incredible woman who not only beat lung cancer, but has gone on to help fundraise for research and speak out with Roy Castle Lung Cancer Foundation to help raise awareness of the disease. Welcome back, and today we're finding out about one of the biggest killers in the UK, lung cancer. We're joined by the wonderful Paula Chadwick and Rochelle have both come here from the Roy Castle Lung Cancer Foundation. Now, lung cancer, as you've heard, kills 44 women each day in the UK, but many do beat the disease. Anne Long was diagnosed with the disease in 2005, and after she won her battle with cancer, Anne decided to join the Roy Castle Foundation in its mission to defeat lung cancer. Gael met up with her to find out about her amazing journey. Anne Long is a resident of Formby. At 81 years old, this great-grandmother still swims three to four times a week. Yet, like more than 21,000 women every year, Anne was diagnosed with lung cancer. She was 69. 12 years later, she tells us her story. I'm perfectly well and fit and I, I swim. Uh, I was swimming outdoors, actually. 
Uh, I used to swim down um, in the woods in Formby. Now I swim uh, in an indoor pool. But um, I noticed, I was brushing my teeth, and I noticed there was a little, when I was swelling out my mouth, there was a little thing, it was like a little amoeba. And I thought, that's odd, I haven't seen that before. I better go to my doctor, whom I knew, but I'm on no medication. I wasn't then, and I'm not now. I'm not on anything now. And uh, she said, oh, don't worry, I'll send you for an x-ray. And um, my friend had said to me that I had this cough for a while, which I hadn't really noticed. It was just a <coughs> It wasn't a bark, you know. And um, anyway, I went and had the x-ray, and uh, then I went along, and I was diagnosed with lung cancer. Half two on the 16th of December, 03. And a consultant, I saw the consultant the next morning at uh, half nine, and he said, Mrs. Long, if it wasn't Christmas next week, I would operate then. Because I'd spoken to a friend of mine who had been a consultant, he's now retired, and he'd said to me, they'll offer you chemo, radiotherapy, or surgery, which will you take? And I said, oh, surgery, I just want to get rid of it. And I didn't tell people about it until I was actually had the operation. And I was operated in Broad Green on the 4th of January, on the 4th of January, 04. And uh, here I am 12 years on. Well, the most difficult thing was to tell my children because they, their father had died from lung cancer, even though they were adults at this time. Uh, whereas they were only children. My youngest was nine when the father died. Uh, may not have been all that aware of it, but um, it's so important, and it's so important to share and to look very hard, look very well at the survivors. With 43 support groups across the UK, the Roy Castle Lung Cancer Foundation helps patients and their families while investing highly in research projects. They were he very helpful, and I have tried to, you know, give help back to them in any way that I can. Uh, and tell people, I think the job they do is fantastic and they're encouraging people and they do a, a terrific amount. I was able to go to groups and we would share and talk and that was the important thing because people are very embarrassed and if they're, comfo if they're comfortable with somebody and somebody has been there and they know what it's like, they can say, because I think it's very difficult for families and I actually having been in both situations I haven't been supporting my husband. I've been in that supportive role and been very difficult. And in those days, as I said, you couldn't talk about cancer. But it's so important now that we do talk. And there is, every day that you hear of new things, the development, and they're recognizing that it can be helped. Anne has also been giving back through the Swim a Mile in a Month challenge, with all the money collected going towards research and support. I really did this swim, I swam last year. Um, but this year I wasn't going to do it till I saw the report in the paper that they were saying that Merseyside is the worst spot in the UK for cancer. And I just want people to know there is life after cancer. And it's very important that people do go to the doctor. You know, it's, it's a blessing to have another day and to look out and this morning is just so beautiful. I live on a first floor and I can look out and see the blossoms on the trees, and it's just beautiful, but every single day, and with meeting people, I, and I try my best to help. And as a result of that, I've started this project in Formby, the Formby project, because I, I worked in Formby a long time ago, and uh, the population in Formby, contrary to everybody's expectations or knowledge, has gone down. It was 33,000, now it's 22 and a half. And there's a lot of older people isolated. So it took me a long time to get it going, but I started the Formby project two and a half years ago. And it's wonderful, we have over 40 people volunteering. Uh, and the people who are visiting are getting as much out of it as those that they're visiting. Oh, what an incredible lady. And it's so nice to see that people are fundraising and out there doing things um, to, to raise more and more awareness. And one of the things in the, in the VT that we looked at was that Merseyside is one of the highest areas of diagnosis, isn't it? And yeah. Glasgow? Yeah. Glasgow is, mm -hmm. yeah, Glasgow is. Um, which is why uh, Professor Donnelly built the research centre here, because it had the highest incidence. So, unfortunately, it had the most patients that you could look mm -hmm. at to, uh, to screen and things. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to say as well that, you know, I, I'm a 
very proud Liverpoolian, um, as I'm sure everybody here is. But the people of Liverpool raised the money to build that centre. We got no government funding or anything, and the people of Mo wow. Liverpool, Merseyside, raised the over two million to build that centre. So they should always be very proud of yeah. what they did, and they continue to support us today. Wow. Brilliantly, yeah. Kathy, you were going to um, speak yeah, to me just about Paula. The break, I was going to ask you. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that it's on the rise mm -hmm. with women. Mm -hmm. Is it the same as men? No, men are uh, levelling out. Um, oh, interestingly enough, yeah, and it's the women that are that are overtaking the men now. And is there any evidence to show why that is? Or well, I think it's because we're seeing, theory. from as I said, from pre-war and just after the war, more mm. women took up the habit of smoking. Mm. Um, I think as well, one of the reasons why we're so passionate about women raising the awareness and saying about it being the biggest cancer killer is that women are the health you know, they are the health professionals of the family. Yes. You know, they're always the ones who are, oh, you don't look well, I'll get you the doctors, I'll get yeah. you the doctors, and they forget about themselves. Yeah. Because, you know, we do tend to put ourselves, it will do tomorrow. You know, I've got to do the ironing, I've got to do that. But, you know, they make sure everybody else gets seen so too. I think it might be a combination of the extra pressures of modern life, as in we're, we're, we're being the carers, but we're also providers now. So yes. we're, yeah. we're doing both mm. and neglecting ourselves more as a result. Definitely, I think. And I think, you know, I'm sure most women will say that, you know, even if you take time out to sit in the garden and have a cup of tea, you feel like you should be doing something else. Mm, you don't deserve that bit of time. How can you have that spare time? So it is about it. And, and I also think as well, women are, you know, no, no disrespect, men like, you know, I love men myself, but women are the fat driving force in any sort of campaign or doing, you know, you ask a woman to do it and it definitely gets done. You know, the whole reason why you know, breast cancer has had such a great outcome. You know, 98% of people who are diagnosed with breast cancer now are, are cured. Yes. Mm. Um, is because women got behind that campaign and really pushed and challenged the government and made sure that there was screening, made sure that the mm. messages got on board. Mm. And, you know, we want the same for lung cancer. I mean, you do so mm. much with the fundraising. Back to yeah. that, you've got your chance to shine. I know you've done Strictly events, haven't yeah. you? We've got the welly walk in October, <laughs> the midnight walks. So reeling them all off, I think I've been at them all. Um, <laughs> but there's, there's so many different ways. And one of the things I did want to touch about was the Light Up a Life service that you've yeah. done, which is yeah. just yeah. amazing that we've done mm. at St George's Hall in, in yeah, December, which thankfully you asked me to speak out, which was an absolute honour. So thank you very much for that. Um, but where you can buy a candle, can't you, if you love ones? Yeah. Yes, and we've done it um, this year as well. We've done it like interactive as well. So because not a lot of everybody can get to the service or whatever. And, you know, we wanted to make it special. So we did an online tree yeah. where people could buy a candle or a present oh, or a bauble awesome. and then they can see it and put a message and their family, they can share it with their family as well. And it's, mm. it, it's quite a nice way of um, celebrating somebody's life as well as remembering their importance yeah. as well without it being too sad. No, I do. And I think that's, that's half the reason when you have lost somebody. Um, it almost keeps their yes. name on, which yes. was why you, you'll be shocked at the title of the ball that I used to run called the Pink and Sparkly. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, the, the, <laughs> so not like so. But what, what you can do as well, what I wanted to touch on, was about you can actually set up tribute funds. I set up the Mike Flynn tribute fund. Mm -hmm. So I feel like his name kept going, but that's something else you can do within Roy yeah, Castle, so that's, isn't it? that's nice that people like to do is like, and remember people on birthdays and if they do special mm -hmm. um, events and fundraise and the money goes into that tribute fund and it's acknowledged and people can blog about it and put photographs up and it's a living memory, mm -hmm. you know, of, mm -hmm. of people sharing. And I think it just gives people comfort from, from that, and I think, as well. it's not just comfort either, is it? Yeah. It, it? It's about getting, it's about talking about it. They yes. were saying, you know, it, the lady then was saying, you know, we didn't talk about cancer. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, the, the, the stigmas about, you know, the conversation is opening up now on every yes. level mm -hmm. concerning, mm -hmm. you know, terminal illnesses of mm -hmm. one kind because or another. so many people are dealing with it now. It yes. used to be a friend of a friend of a friend who had it, and now, all yes. of us have, have yes. been touched, haven't we, yes. unfortunately? Yes. Yes. That's the very sad thing. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Paula and Michelle. And after we get back, we are going to be talking about what's been trending this week. So make sure that you stay here with us at 52%. Welcome back. Now today we are going to be looking at again what's trending. This is where we're up to. What's it been like this week, Sarah? What's taken your eye? My eye this weekend, the London elections for mayor, 
Sadiq Khan being promoted, the first Muslim mayor. Oh, that's, yeah, that was, that was a triumph. As far as I'm concerned, it's a triumph because I, I've been quite sort of downhearted about the whole uh, viewpoint against, you know, against Muslim people gen generally and, and putting everybody into one yeah. bag. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. a terrorist. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's wonderful that the people of London have given this man an opportunity to show us what he's made of. Mm. But I was very concerned about the BBC coverage, to be honest, because it did seem to be very Tory biased, surprisingly. So I don't know if anybody else noticed that. And But despite all that, he still won. And yeah. You know, the Tories ran, you know. It's a it's fantastic voice for the, sort of for the people, isn't it, mm. really? I like you know, his message, unity. Yes. Whereas yes. you know, yes. Labour yeah. seemed to be yeah. like, you know, you've got to pick a side, pick yes. a side. It's sort of his yeah. device yeah. of an adversarial, yeah. isn't yeah. it? And it's yeah. so nice that, you know, somebody's talking yeah. about working together. Yes. Yes. That's what we should yeah. be doing. The question is, yes. can he do the job, though? That's we'll the key see. thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's we'll a shame see. it's had to become such a big issue, really, though, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? It's a shame it had to have such a big deal made of it. But it's, you know, it's funny, isn't it? Whenever I think of Mayor of London, I always think of Dick Whittington and you his do, cat. Yeah, little, but go, but back, going yeah. back to um, traditions like, and, and old things, you know, what about the penny? I mean, it, what aren't countries giving up a currency? Well, or something? I know. Do you know what? And I, I get what's happening with it with the whole, oh, it's a penny, it's two penny. But mm. for me, well, one big thing, and I am a child at heart, but it's it's like the whole your pennies and your two we, you, you put them in your jar you save yeah. them up you take Just them out and that money, that's but... like your money because we do save it up and it's like have you got any pennies at the end of so the day you and like to see the, the penny and the 2p disappear oh, then not no? at all no it's what is it look after the pennies and the pounds oh, yeah. or look after I themselves to, i very rarely use cash i just use everything on card just so yes. for me having any coins or anything yeah. loose the only time yeah. i use it is you know you go to the supermarket it's self-service it's like oh okay i'll just throw, all throw in, all my yeah. coins yeah. in and everything yeah mm -hmm. but it is oh dear and i just think it's one of those things that you just i know you've got your 99p and your pound and in your head you think if you buy something for 19.99, it's better than buying it for 20, oh, isn't it? Absolutely. Even well, it's though probably costing more though to produce them. I think that's part of the argument. Right. Is that oh. it's actually costing more to produce the small coins now mm. and than it is for the worth of the out, actual you know, coin. Big bottles of them all. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's quite fun though, sticking it them in is. your little jar or your money box and then taking it out and suddenly you've got I don't know eight quid or something. But it is, and that's, that's the whole fun. <laughs> and it's almost the thing that you do to teach your children money to save money, because yeah. you think, well, there you go, do and that. And they can see yeah. it yeah. growing. Oh, no, we're oh. keeping hold of my pennies and two. That sounded terrible, didn't it? Keeping hold of my pennies yeah. and two peas. <laughs> Maisie, swiftly moving on. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, David Attenborough, oh. you know, turning 90. Yeah, yeah I mean, he's, he's such a treasure, isn't he? And he's, his attitude, though, fantastic. I mean, that, uh, you know, joie de vivre, the, the joy of all life, actually, Absolutely. and the preciousness of all of that. Yes. You know, he's just fantastic. And his I, voice. I love him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the whole thing. And he's just so sharp. He's just, you know... He's, and they've he's named that, that boat after oh, him boat. in, in honour, haven't you they? But they didn't drop Boaty McBoatface. Boaty McBoatface <laughs> is one <laughs> of the satellite hilarious. submarines. And I'm so happy that somewhere in British waters there's this submarine bobbing Full along boating. called Boaty yeah. McBoatface. Don't you love the British sense of humour, though, yes. that like 145,000 yeah. people voted for Boaty <laughs> McBoatface. <laughs> <laughs> and the fantastic thing, and it wasn't rude. It's yeah. just funny. It's just funny. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Which is it's just hilarious. Could you imagine having to make that decision though? Do we keep this name, which has yes. been voted for by the public, <laughs> or do we actually, you know, do a more I sensible think that name? That's a pretty good compromise. Yeah. Myself, probably yeah. all sat there going, yeah. "Are we having a laugh?" Yeah. Really? <laughs> you can't. The boat of the boat face gang can't turn around and go. We don't want to call it, Dave, you know, David Attenborough, because no. that would just be yeah, oh, beyond yes, yes. the pale. I mean, It'd when you think incident. across his career, I mean, yeah. 90 years, and uh, it, it just doesn't look or seem any different. No. He's like almost ageless, isn't he? Mm, absolutely. Yeah. He's yeah. just yeah. brilliant. And I think because yeah. we've it's had a such a person. shocking year, yeah. it just it's seems like every day you open the paper and you're like, oh, good grief. It's just It's lovely to celebrate awful. somebody who's still with us and let's, yes. uh, let's yes. hold close and treasure what we've yeah, got. Yeah, let's get a little yeah. bit of nice news. And of mm. course, we've had the BAFTAs. Oh, because um, Paula was saying earlier about being at the BAFTAs, obviously, yeah. she'd gone down with some of the short films she made, but the BAFTAs. And uh, again, just something that, I think it was you when we were talking earlier, said it's great to see people supporting like sort of English, the BBC, everything yes. like that, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I know I criticised the BBC just then, but, um, I, you know, the, the BBC also has a lot of plus points. And, uh, you know, it is great that yeah. the, the, the British work is being yeah. supported. It, it's interesting. When I talk to friends who are, you know, um, who are in America or overseas and they, they, 
they do see the BBC. And they, they really value the BBC and they turn around to us and they say, do not get rid of it. Mm. Because, you know, we do have, you know, the best TV on the whole, yes. you know, anywhere in the world. Yeah, like, really. like and that's everything partly, that has its faults. Partly due, partly due to the fact that we've, we've got a non, we've got a non-commercial channel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, that's it's, really important. It's important that to we hang keep on to that. That's so important to hang on Something to it. Yeah. So again, so typically British, isn't it? But one thing that uh, that with Peter Kay, did anybody see what he did? Because this is though. absolutely I hilarious. And it's so Peter Kay, and I was so thrilled that he won what he won for a car share. Yeah. But uh, he, and they all, everybody had been told beforehand, you know, to stop everybody going on and on. Um, right, you've got a minute. You'll have a minute to do your thank you speeches, <laughs> okay? Just a minute. So they said, when you get to the end of that minute, a red light will appear, yeah. and if you haven't finished talking at the end of that minute, something, you know, yeah. you know the you'll cane with the hook on the end will pull you off. Nothing's <laughs> going to happen. It'll lit. Yeah, like the hook, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be taken off. So, lo and behold, Peter Kay gets up there, and he stands there, and he doesn't say a word for, like, 58 seconds, just like that. Then he goes, thank you. <laughs> 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 it's just so right typical for Peter K, right isn't time. it? And you just think the fact that he can do it. But again, so it, it's just great to be able to celebrate these people, isn't yeah. it? It's just, it's just fantastic. And yeah. I think, um, I think one of the things that won Wolf Hall won quite oh, a lot, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. Well, that was that was fantastic. Actually. Yeah, well, Wolf Hall was brilliant. I, I need to have a little look at that. You see, I got quite into the Tudors a few years ago, <laughs> but Oof. I think it was really because I thought Henry VIII looked like Jonathan Rees Myers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a bit too much, you know, the reality of it was Mark a bit Rylance. different. It's brilliant. Because yeah. he, he won quite. He won the so best actor. Thomas Cromwell, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah Mark Rylance was best actor. Fantastic. Brilliant. So what about Sarah, anything else caught your eye this well, week in the headlines? Not caught my eye, but I have to say this weekend, the weather. Like, oh, oh yes. And bearing in mind, I've spent the three months in Australia and then Morocco. Oh, and, and then you sun... did your marathons through the yeah, Sahara. Yeah, right. So the hot temperatures are fantastic. So getting up to 26 degrees, I was finding like, yes, great weather in the UK. So and did you guys do last, anything? At last. It's, yeah. it's the way the barbecues. Do you know what the funny <laughs> thing is that makes me laugh <laughs> about when the hot weather comes out? Because it's... And this isn't sexist, but it's such a man thing, a barbecue, isn't it? You know, oh, yeah, yeah. you don't see them on any social media. A bit of sunshine comes out. Well, you can see all the steaks out there and all the fellas out there. And there's a comedy apron yeah, involved. Just do that. Just get out there and do it. <laughs> but it's... It's just one of those things, isn't it? That you you, you literally see a bit of sunshine and oh, you're yeah. wild. And, and you're like, whoa! It's been such a dark winter. I mean, it hasn't yeah. been cold, but it's just been wet and miserable and, yeah. you know, since Seems about so November. And so it's lovely. The sun's out, your birds are singing. They're going bonkers, actually. Yeah. I'm telling you what, at, if this carries on for more than a week, they will be moaning. You, get, yeah. they, you know, social media, like, oh, it's too hard, I can't go. I can't breathe. But uh, yeah, I won't be. I love the heat. You can crank it up as high as you like for me. You know what, it doesn't matter how hot it is, wherever I take my mother, she ends up in a draft and moans it's cold. <laughs> <laughs> she could be sat in the farmers and she'd be in a draft. Maisie, anything else? You've always got stuff oh, to uh, that you know, pass along the way. It's been it's been a it's been a funny old week this week, actually, hasn't it? There's not been it, I I haven't noticed that much really you know, sort of big and juicy in the yeah. news, except the, for the, the, the you know, we have the, the elections. Uh, yes. One thing That's that we have done this week in work, and we had um, her on the show not so long ago, Carol Kirkham from Zoe's Place. Oh, yes. Uh, we had a superhero day in, in work at Radio City. Oh, I saw uh, pictures yeah, of you up. in your yeah. lovely Did I get walk. dressed up? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Do you need to ask that super girl at the rescue? Um, but it went across all the stations, across Radio City, yeah. Radio City 2, City Talk. And I think what Carol Kirkham spoke about who runs Zoe's Place when she came in here, I think you expect so many of these charities to be government funded and you know yeah, they get a certain yeah. amount but that's yeah. that's to cover their staffing to cover the equipment they need Zoe's place has it's it's a, be a beautiful it's like I can't tell you what it's like there. It's not a place of doom and gloom. No. Mm. They do have the bereavement suite where families can go mm. and, and they need they needed the money to be able to build mm. uh, an extension there for the families so the families can be there mm. and not just the child. And after a day of fundraising and thank you to everybody's generosity on Friday. How much did you uh, raising? Well, the final total for Friday mm. was 64,100. Wow. <laughs> and the money's still rolling in oh, now. So fantastic. it's... Um, that's great. Well, that that's, an an that's another day. organisation, a bit like you know the, the Roy Castle Lung yeah. Cancer Foundation. I, I was surprised to hear that Generation the people 
people of Liverpool yeah. had funded yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the same with Zoe's place and with yeah. Clare House. They, they, yeah. There's no good, there's very little government help. No. But somehow, yeah. we're all coming together yeah. and doing the things. And, of the but that's yeah. what's so good about this city and that all, all my family have, have, have grown up in Liverpool and that's Ooh. where, you know, mm -hmm. I, I I just think that it's a, it's a different city than anywhere else in the world. And, and people think you say it because you're from here, but they do. It's like it everyone's is. your family in this. Yes. You know, you only have to look if someone's in a reality TV show. They're like, yes, come on, let's all get. It. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's how it goes. Leon isn't it? and June. Yes. Yeah, come on. I love the great. <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, it has been, it's been a different week in the news, but some nice stories as well, hasn't yeah, it? Yes, so and it does make a change to have that. And may, you know, with the sun coming out, and I mean, you know, I don't want to, you know, bang on about about Hillsborough, but I feel like things have really yeah. changed in yeah. Liverpool since that verdict totally. came out. Yeah. Yeah. And I know I criticised the BBC earlier, but the day of the vigil, I was watching it live, just almost a wreck on the floor. I'm so glad I didn't go down mm. there. Yeah. Um, I, but I, I force myself to sit and watch, because yeah. I don't like watching news. I'm a bit too sensitive mm. to images. Yeah. But their coverage was fantastic. Amazing. Absolutely really, amazing. Really, really yeah, good. Yeah. Well, thank you for all of you once again today, and uh, do join us next time. Thank you.